gonna start recording. All right, this is episode seven of the Ding Food Podcast. Welcome. I'm Jack. So the name no longer tentative. <laughs> I mean, as long as we can't come up with something else better, this is the name, you know. Fair enough. It's just every time before you're like, um, name to be decided. <laughs> yeah, you know, I realize it's it's probably less awkward. It's just uh, to just rock with the Ding Food, you know. It's all about the confidence. Keep committed. Yeah. For now, for now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this episode, we wanted to talk about uh, this book that Tony brought up to my attention. It's called Lifespan by David S. Sinclair. Um, actually, there is a subtitle, which I forgot. Do you remember what it was? Why We no. Age and Why We Don't Have To, I think. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, real quick, Tony, tell me, um, what like led you to, to start reading this book? Like, What was your motivations? How did you discover it? And then... Uh, why did you want to talk about it on today's episode? First of all, why do I want to talk about it? Well, I mean, like, it's a pretty important topic. Sure, sure. Uh, um, yeah, okay, so a little background, I guess. Um, how did I hear about the book? Well, honestly, I came across the book pretty uh, serendipitously. Like, I was looking for a book to read. Yeah. I was looking on Goodreads, and I think this was, like, one of the top nonfictions of 2019 on their book list. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I started reading it, like, I guess, I guess we can go back a little bit. So some of the stuff talked about in the book, I've actually come across before. So, okay. um, probably like from, for like five, six years now, I've listened to like the Tim Ferriss podcast. Like, have you heard of that one? Yeah. Yeah. I actually haven't heard the podcast itself, but I'm aware. Yeah. It's not bad. I think it's like kind of one of the OG podcasts too, that got really big. Right. Um, right. Like, especially yeah, the wrong. format of just interviewing people. So he's interviewed, uh, for example, this doctor called Peter Atia in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And um, Peter Atia also has a podcast, and he focuses on like longevity and aging and stuff. So I've listened to that before, so I have a little little bit of background in this already. And the Davis and Claire book kind of brought it together in this way more, I guess, structured format. Like yeah. I had heard pieces here and there, but I never really got super into it because. Right. It was always like super in depth on Peter Tia's podcast, like maybe talking about like all these molecular pathways and stuff, and like mm-hmm. I just glaze over. Um, but for example, David Sinclair mentioned like metformin, right? Yes. I first about I first heard about um, taking metformin for longevity from Peter Tia and Tim Ferriss like three or four years ago, I'd say. Okay. Um, and they also and talked about it like, on the All In podcast, I believe. Chamat said he was taking that among some other things like you said it's medicine for the rich right so it's, it's, it's probably like a for the rich. it's probably like a starter pack that you receive the moment you hit a billion dollars like net worth you just get something in your mail it's like the lifespan starter pack. <laughs> <laughs> the metformin it's got like a membership to like some cryotherapy yeah. like, like, it's oh, got like the, the the phone number to jeff bezos blood boy on speed dial <laughs> Is, uh, yeah, I need to hear more about that. I actually don't know what happened there. Oh, it's, I actually don't know if it's a rumor or like how played up it is, but like there's just this thing about how like Jeff Bezos has like this 20 year old young, you know, dude, just don't give him blood. I don't really get if there's any science behind it or if it's even real, but it's, it's something I heard about. Okay, yeah, that's kind of the gist I got too. I'm, yeah. I, I don't know. I haven't dug into the science, but I suspect it's probably like probably at least deemed safe and they've probably seen like some preliminary results that show promise like right right if there's anything that's like super established because if it was i think it'd probably be more well known uh-huh um, so it's kind of like they they're like oh this can't really hurt you like maybe it can help you kind of thing let's try it out yeah i feel like that's where all these like um these high-end concierge medicine docs and their longevity stuff research is really at i don't think Mm. it's at anything further than that i don't think it's at a stage where it's like super uh well known whether or not it truly works i don't think they've done the proper clinical trials for that Mm -hmm. and in the absence of that though they deemed it like a good shot i think is i think is where they're getting at gotcha okay and we can talk about why the research is kind of at that point later uh Mm-hmm. But yeah, for now, I mean, let's let's get back to um, the initial topic. So, like you said, you discovered this book, um, 
and it appealed to you because it had all this information that you were kind of sparingly glancing at before that was compiled, very structured, uh, well formatted, and you you obviously thought you learned a lot from it because you know you brought it to my attention and you wanted to talk about it, um, and yeah, I think it's it's definitely very eye opening. It's really good read. Um, so I mean, let's just get into it, man. What what was your first thought like? when you <laughs> okay so going back to a little bit to what you said yeah like it really put everything together mm-hmm. but i mean really the biggest motivation was like if you can live longer isn't that motivation enough <laughs> yeah that's true that's true um, yeah and i think the value in it is like i've heard pieces and pieces here and there of like intermittent fasting metformin yeah um like there's also another drug for rapamycin that's kind of being touted by some people there's like the resveratrol stuff Mm -hmm. there's like the nad uh supplements and stuff i've heard those all over the place like pieces here and there and i think this book though you know told a story right yeah and like you said it gave some actionable things that you can do and he also talked about like some of the social implications which i thought was like really pretty interesting for sure um yeah so you were asking, like, what was my first thoughts after reading this? I was like, okay, uh, what was my first thought? My first thought was like, oh, cool, I, I'm going to live longer. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think my second thought was like, okay, how am I going to do that? Like, and can I trust the research? Is the research truly there for me to just go and take a, a metformin, right? Right. Because metformin is indicated right now just for uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's our, like, kind of go-to drug. That we learned about in, in med school i see okay um and then all these other supplements like where can i get them right like is it safe um which companies are reputable i think that's a huge struggle right mm-hmm. with supplements um and then finally i think my thought was like okay how much is this going to cost in the future and how much money do i need to make right it's, it's literally kind of like what you said in the book which is like if you had to take all these drugs right that make you live longer or do all these things like uh, cryotherapy and stuff, right? Yeah. I think it, it can cost money, right? The the bill can build up, right. right? And so I think my next thought was like, okay, this is pushing back my early retirement plan. <laughs> right. I mean, okay, doesn't the, doesn't the, the, the very nature of extending your lifespan also push back your early retirement plan? Because now you have to live off of your accumulated wealth for longer than expected. Uh, it doesn't because because of the five percent uh, rule. Yeah, like the four percent rule oh, is 4% such that right, yeah. you don't your your principle doesn't move, right? Yeah, um, I guess what I'm getting at is, do, do you think you'll, do you think the principle that you think you would need to live for the rest of your life would change, if if your lifespan increases by, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years, etc. It shouldn't as long as your yearly expenditure doesn't change, right? It shouldn't. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, do you think your values would change? This is what I'm trying to get at. My values would change. You, you know what way? Well, I think, like, people, when they think long term, they're, like, they're thinking of an arbitrary, like, age probably between 70 to 90 when, when they would die, right? And so, I think everything we do, we kind of have this timeline in mind where we're expecting the end of it to be at around that point. And if you were to suddenly increase that by 30, like a third, it, 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 sh- it should have some effect on just cultural expectations and where you expect to be at which point in your life at, at a certain age, right? And I, I haven't thought about it enough to, to say like, oh yeah, this, this would make me want to spend more or less, but... I think there has to be some effect. Fair enough. I, I, I think I can see where you're getting at. And I think for me, my gut reaction would probably be that I need uh, less principle because I can always work more. Sure, sure. Because I have more time. I, I think that's probably how I would see it, um, which I guess is a good thing. And I guess before we talk more about this, just in case you know other people are listening, <laughs> we should, maybe we should um, kind of just give a quick summary of the book. Oh yeah, that's that's a good point. Sure. Um, <laughs> do you want to do you want to do it? Do you want to try it? 
Uh, I mean, yeah, we could, you could feel free to cover anything that I missed, but um, pretty much so David Sinclair comp compiles a lot of research and kind of breaks down the factors that he believes um, affects aging and your lifespan, right? And um, so, okay, one of the first points is he says to view aging as a disease, um, which at first I didn't really kind of think too much about it. I was like, okay, this sounds like something, like I didn't really think about the meaning of those words, but it seems like it would have implications like in the medical field regarding like how we treat or how we view aging, right? Like, can you expand more on that? Because when I heard aging as a disease, it almost sounds like something you hear from like a movie. Like it's like a cool quote that you don't really think more about, but um, yeah, like I, I think you can hopefully offer some more insight on why that's important. Um, what like part of it is just semantics, but the other aspect okay. of it, I guess, is setting up cultural expectations and influencing policy. Right. So if you can't manage to classify it as a disease, then you'd possibly be able to get more funding to treat it. And we probably have, I think he mentioned like better data collections. For example, when we um, write down like on death certificates, why a patient died, right? Like yeah. we usually state a, a cause, right? That's not just old, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> like the, like the, Tim Duncan, DNMP, DNMP old. <laughs> yeah. Classic. There's no like death old, right? You have to say like cardiac arrest or like right. whatever. And then like uh, cardiac arrest secondary to like a myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. um, so that aspect, just the record keeping and I guess shifting the focus to this thing is something that we should tackle rather than just something to accept. I think that's what he's really trying to do. Okay. Get. Yeah. So that was, that's what I was trying to get you to explain i guess to me um and the viewers all two of you i'm being optimistic there's probably only one and it's jeff <laughs> but uh <laughs> <laughs> who knows maybe i'll rewatch re it you know one day <laughs> no but um so okay what else um so yeah throughout the yeah. book um he he breaks down a lot of these things or he he tries to explain like why we age and it's, it's definitely something that like we as people don't even think about, right? We just accept aging as a natural part of our human lives. But he kind of argues that, or like he, he's making the argument that um, in fact, you can do many things to delay or straight up prevent um, aging, right? So one of the things he talks about is, um, what is it like activating your um, longevity gene or activating your survival, I forget the term, but it has to do with kind of your daily um, lifestyle, right? Just eating healthy, um, uh, exercising. He mentioned intermittent fasting, which was interesting to me. I didn't realize that had an effect on this, but um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just kind of jump in. Um, so he basically has a central hypothesis, right? And okay. the central hypothesis is sort of like way back a long, long time ago, before we were humans, before we were probably even mammals, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at a certain point, uh, maybe we're just multi multicellular or even unicellular organisms that we had this sort of two system. One system is the reproductive, like re, uh, is the system that kicks in when we reproduce, mm -hmm. right? And the other system is the system that kick in when we're just trying to survive, right? So because right, the right. evolutionary biology, I guess, you have really just two central things that living things want to do, right? Which is survive, survive. and reproduce. Sure. <laughs> right. And so it puts them in these two modes. And what you're saying is basically that um, when you are reproducing, you're, you're using up a lot of your energy, right? Yeah. And uh, you only do it when you're basically in a, like, how would I say it? When you're in a, in a mode where you have a lot of energy, like you're well fed, for example, right? You're well rested and whatever, like you have a lot of energy. And then in the sort of starvation mode, you do not reproduce, right? you're right. just trying to survive. Right. And he said that um, during the survival mode, your you have a system kick in that repairs your DNA. And He's, his sort of theory around aging is that this DNA repair, it, like DNA sort of miscoding, I guess, right? It is one of the huge drivers for aging. 
-hmm. So that mm -hmm. if we can activate a system that allows us to repair our DNA, then it will lead to longevity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's slowing down the process of our DNA getting damaged and miscoded. Right, right. Like that. And so ways to achieve that would be things like intermittent fasting because that puts us into that survival mode rather than the reproduction mode. Right, that's mm -hmm. why intermittent fasting works. Similar to, um, he said, like, like putting yourself in kind of some level of stress. So he called it hormesis, right? Right. Yeah. Which is different from homeostasis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so another way to achieve hormesis, he said, is um, is like, for example, exp ex uh, exp exposed, exposing your body to outside the comfortable temperature zone right so you want yeah, yeah, like yeah. colder or or warmer right right, right. Yeah. and also exercise um these things will trigger that survival mechanism and the dna repair mechanism so that's kind of the gist i got mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah so he he breaks down he kind of gives you his his um hypotheses for aging and he breaks down like all the reasons why like doing the things he listed will benefit um which was really helpful and he also talks about like chemicals you can take drugs obviously um we, t we touched on that briefly um and then eventually he talks about social implications of aging which actually is what kind of what i'm most interested in talking about actually um but we might just a little bit longer i am i am but i for the purpose of the podcast i'm interested in discussing the implications <laughs> of that you know what i mean for Fair living enough. longer, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of the what the book is about, really. Um, and so yeah, let's let's keep let's keep going on on just the things he brought up, right? Like you, um, like you said, he he lists all these things that you can we can do in our daily lives, and um, pretty much all of them are pretty are very achievable, right? Like it doesn't take that much extra effort for us to incorporate these to our lives if you wanted. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the crazy thing about the book are some of the claims he's made, right? For example, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there's probably someone alive today who will live to 150. Yeah, I'm definitely a little skeptical. And I, I did kind of dismiss a couple of them as, you know, just uh, hyperbole. But yeah, well, what do you think about what he said? Like, do you think we'll see someone live to 150? Uh, actually, that I can see it. Today, I can see it. I, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that, um, like, I, I think for those who have, like, a really good lifestyle, I, I can see, like, a lot of us living to 100, at least. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but it's, you know, it's really difficult to predict the future. But I think that's sort of, like, one thing that really jumps out at you with this book, right? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of not promise but that kind of prediction yeah right? like the confidence kind of, of it is, is very jarring at first like whoa that's a big claim and then the more you read the more like this guy might be onto something you know <laughs> yeah yeah and like that i think that really is kind of what caught my attention right because mm -hmm. if it said like oh you'll live another two years right that's kind of within the margin of error <laughs> 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 Right, but like if we're talking like 20, 30, 40, 50 years, then mm -hmm. that is quite important. I think that's something worth paying attention to, right? Right, um, and I think this whole space of research of people working in, in this field, I think it's it's quite amazing, and I wish there was more funding towards it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. so. Yeah, I did want to talk about that still. We'll get to that probably later. Um, so we can mm -hmm. we can still talk about the I guess the things that you can do on your own right like the things that he listed that you know like okay. what we just talked about regarding better lifestyle habits to kick in the survival mechanism um, to rebuild your DNA I wanted to ask you so like all these things are things that we we could be putting into practice in our daily lives so are you putting these things into practice Pretty much, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Like, nice. mine is obviously the exogenous, like the exogenous drugs, right? Like, mm -hmm. minus that. Yeah. Not taking metformin, I'm not taking any of the supplements. It's something that I'll look into probably this summer or something, right? But mm -hmm. not at the moment. Mm -hmm. Especially because, like, I think making change slowly, 
is better than making chain really fast. Okay, that's fair. I think if as long as you're taking the, a a good a step in the right direction every single day, you're improving a little bit every day. I think that's really good. Yeah. Um. So what do I do? Well, I do the intermittent fasting. So I eat between the hours of. 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Usually, probably like 7:30 or 7 is usually when I am. So I eat dinner at six. Right. Um, so that's eight hours, and that leaves a 16-hour fasting window, right? So usually, I'll be a bit hungry um, before noon, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? I mean, when it was cold outside here, it was really easy to get cryotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would run outside like minus 20. Or minus like 10 have you started weather, taking right? like ice cold showers i have not i guess that's something i should do like because winter's ending Cause, snow is melting because you know how you said like you've, you've heard like different parts of, of like things to improve your lifespan before like one of those things i heard a long time ago was, was cold showers although they didn't it wasn't specified as like something that would improve your lifespan it was like oh this is good for your health it's good for your skin just like leave a cold shower on um so yeah, like I think this kind of information has been floating around. Maybe before it was considered more pseudoscience, but now there's maybe more research into it. But um, yeah, I guess I want to bring that up. Whenever, Go on. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say like whenever something is sort of on the cutting edge, at first it seems like pseudoscience, right? Yeah, and it does. Even now, like us being like talking about this and knowing about it, I think we're probably in the early adopter stage, right? Yeah. Still, right? So we're still very far from mainstream. That's true. Uh, yeah, the cold showers, I haven't heard. It's probably something I'll look into. I mean, it's super easy to do, so mm -hmm. that's yeah. pretty good. What else I do? I mean, I exercise a lot, uh, but that's just me. Like, that's something I've always done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably with more of an em emphasis on, like, stability of joints and stuff now, because, so Peter T has always talked about, so this is a, a doctor in the U.S. He has a podcast. Um, he's always talked about like this thing he calls the centena centenarian Olympics, mm -hmm. which is like what he hopes to be able to do when he's a hundred. Right. And these are really basic movements, but the biggest thing is like preserving your joints because if those things go, they don't really come back. Right. I see. Like your soft tissue is the ones that you really have to worry about when they get injured. And so having the strength, the stability, uh, to get there right and not developing super bad osteoarthritis and stuff right um it'd be really nice if yeah. you're living that old if you remember from the book in lifespan he talked about how he had some problems with his teeth and his dentist was about to do something that you know would help him but like i think removes his teeth or something mm -hmm. and he's like oh no no no! i want i want to keep these babies until 150. <laughs> right <laughs> like, he changed the plan completely yeah yeah so that's so exercise exposure to cold, intermittent fasting. Uh, other things I do that I don't think I really talked about in the book are sort of just like sleeping well and like trying to not to get as stressed, like stress management. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that that's the underrated part is just your level of stress. I always feel like whenever I have some random odd issues, it, you can trace it back to stress. Um, stress and sleep, I feel like are very yeah, good. there's a great book um, called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, written by this guy called Robert Robert Sapolsky. Um, he actually has a documentary on with National Geographic, I think. Um, you can find it on, on YouTube. I think it's like Stress, Portrait of a Killer or something like that. <laughs> um, it's quite old, but it's really entertaining and it's really interesting. That is interesting. Um, he talks about his research on kind of like, uh, were, they, were they baboons or chimpanzees? I think baboons. <laughs> Um, and on their stress levels, on their social hierarchy too. And they kind of like did an analogy between that and the, uh, the UK sort of like bureaucratic, uh, national like government system mm -hmm. and how like different levels have different stress levels and they could be, uh, it shows up through their health as well. So stress definitely big, big part and sleep as well. I think there's a good book on sleep by Matthew Walker on why we sleep. Okay. That sounds interesting. Giving a lot of resources. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You read a book on every topic, huh? I think right now I probably go through a book every four days, I want to say. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's what happens when you're on Zoom University. <laughs> <laughs>
so much time. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's good. it's good that you're doing all that. And the reason I asked you is because nothing you listed is overwhelmingly difficult to do, right? Like those all seem like pretty common sense. Maybe intermittent fasting, like some people will, you know, like are like people have different preferences, whatever, for their own diets. But for the most part, those things are very easy to implement into your daily lives. So then the question is, why don't more people do it? I mean, did you know about all these things before you read the book? I mean, I guess when you frame it in terms of if you do all these things, you will live to 150. No, I didn't think about it from that perspective. I think that's exactly why, right? Like if you hear about random things, like you hear all sorts of things, right? You hear like, oh, chocolate's good for you. Wine is good for you, right? And the next day it'll be like, carrots are good for you. And the next day it'll be like, carrots are bad for you. And the wine's bad for you. And chocolate's good for you, et cetera, et cetera, right? And somewhere in there you hear like, oh, intermittent fasting is good for you. Keto diet is good for you. Then you hear someone else say, oh, the plant-based diet is good for you. Carnivore diet is good for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you just start lumping all these health advice into one. That's exactly it. One thing yeah. That you cannot trust. You think you cannot trust any of it because it's so inconsistent. Yeah, like nothing Particularly they're all up. coming from different sources. Right. That's a that's an important point. The different sources are what often gives conflicting information. Yeah, I guess that's interesting. Let me ask you then, because it's like I guess I'm I'm in the healthcare field, right? Like I, I'm studying medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously I read a lot about these things and I think I, I know a decent amount. So like from your perspective, you know, as like a tech guy who's not in medicine, like where do you get your health advice, right? Or like, what did you believe in? And like, what, mm. what did you think was true or not true? Uh, I'll be honest, it's, it's not something that I, and when I say this, it sounds silly, but it's not something that I specifically research, like what should I do on the daily to live longer? It's more like accumulated information throughout my life, right? Like your doctors will be telling you some, like to do this, your, your parents tell you to do this. Uh, you hear about something like through word of mouth or on the internet, like for intermittent, intermittent fasting, keto, blah, 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 right? And then for me, it's like the things that seem to have passed the test of time, like like information that you, you've been hearing about from multiple sources over time that seems to still hold up, right? Like common sense things like sleep well, like exercise daily, um, eat healthy. Uh, like th I think those are things that I just end up naturally taking in. Um, and sticking with, uh, except again, I'm not really motivated by living longer, which I really should be <laughs> when you frame it in terms of that, like that's really, that should be the only motivation in life. If you think about <laughs> no brainer, <laughs> your motivation in life should be to live the duh, duh, right. But, um, it's funny because when I'm doing these things, I'm not thinking about, Oh, like I'm going to doing this today is going to help me increase my lifespan by three hours, you know, like it's hard to think about it from that perspective, but it's easy to be like, Oh, if I eat healthy, if I exercise, I'll look good, you know? And mm. that is, that is the more common motivation for, I would say the majority of people when they go on a diet, when they go to the gym, when they, right? Like, uh, the, the point is to make yourself look better. You, you want to, you want to look better physically. And a lot of times that can, that can help with your mental health as well. Right. That can help your confidence. That can help your uh, ability to just go out and do stuff in public and not be so self-conscious like that, that that can definitely help and i'll tell you from personal experience um after waterloo i was not in a good spot mentally right i was pretty uh pretty low on my self-esteem and i definitely got really stressed whenever not even going out but the thought of going out and just like if my friend would invite me hey like let's go get dinner with like blah 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 and I just can't help but think like, oh, what if they start asking me about my school? I would have to make up some stuff, right? And I would just get really anxious. And my first step to kind of going out of that shell was to start exercising, start going to the gym regularly. And it really helped me build up my confidence from the ground up again. Um, and so this, that was kind of a tangent, but I guess my main point was a lot of the, like a lot of the motivations that we have in life, um, it's like we're not prioritizing, we're not consciously thinking about 
oh, this is going to help me live longer. This will, this will, you know what I mean? Like very rarely, it seems, are we actually motivated by doing healthy things for the sake of our health. It, it almost seems like it's like a, it's like an afterthought, you know? And I would argue part of it is because we've never really thought about how, like how much this kind of stuff can increase our lifespan. Like it's, it's always been arbitrary. Like, oh, like you will live longer, you will live healthy. It's very arbitrary. But then if you can put a number on it, like if you do all these things, you'll live to 150. Like that puts it into perspective, right? If you frame it like that, then everybody should be doing this. Yeah, I mean, he probably should not frame it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but on the other side, yeah, like I think there's just been so little attempts to quantify all these things, right? And it's extremely difficult to quantify. I think that's why sure, people it don't is, give it you is. an estimate. And also, I think there's a mis, probably misinterpretation of data too, right? Like think about the criteria in in research for what constitutes. Uh, significant research is literally statistical significance, which never quantifies the effect size. Like, do you understand what I'm talking about? The effect size, you said? Yeah. So what they're looking for is a P less than 0 0.05, right? Okay. Yeah. Now you can have, so let's suppose this, let's suppose I have one fair coin, right? That's 50, 50 and I have a coin that's a little bit biased and it says 55, 45. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I flip 10 coin, uh, 10 flips on each coin, we probably won't be able to tell a difference, right? In the proportion of heads, let's say, right? But if we flip it 10,000 times, okay? Now it's very obvious that one's coming up heads 50% of the time and the other one's coming up 55% of the time. Right, so right. So that will have a high statistical significance. My estimate p-value for that is probably like 0 0.00000. Okay? Sure, sure. Now, how big is that effect? That effect is 5%. It's actually relatively tiny. In fact, with 10,000 flips, you can probably detect this effect of 1%. So a 5149 coin versus a 5050 coin, right? But researchers treat that the same. And that's a misunderstanding of statistics, right? And I've seen that so many times in academia. That treat that the same. Oh, okay. I see which, okay. Yeah. Because to them, all, all, they're, all they're waiting for is for their machine, like SPSS or whatever, Stata, whatever the, the program they're using to spit out p is less than 0 0.05 with like a star and they'll be like oh yeah we're good right like that's all they're looking for right they don't really understand statistics damn i, I think i can say that was with a high degree of confidence having seen how research is done high degree um, of confidence what's your p value p va let's say um hmm how do you even put a p value on that <laughs> as a statistician i'm like trying to think that it doesn't even make sense <laughs> but um <laughs> Um, okay, so getting back though to what you were saying about like, and I think I, I'm willing to go down, down that tangent a little bit more, which yeah, is yeah. why do people not think about this? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's because people don't think about things from a first principles fundamental perspective, right? They don't go into that's what I'm kind of trying to get at. Yeah, but go on, go on. Exactly, that's why I'm yeah, going. Yeah, exactly. They're coming in. They're they're thinking. Okay, they're not coming in like a fucking alien. Like this is probably how Elon Musk would think about this. <laughs> and this multicellular organism, right? <laughs> and what matters to me, right? Okay, like uh, examining the data shows that money doesn't necessarily buy happiness. Okay, like your happiness tends to um, cap off, right? Plateau at mm -hmm. a certain level of income. I think, uh, I think I studied this back when I did my psych degree. Um, and then, okay, so what really matters to me? Okay, well. Um, if life is worth preserving, if life is worth living, the more of it is probably better than less of it, mm -hmm. right? And then now you're quickly moving towards like, okay, then I want more of enjoyable life, right? And so the more life part is there, right? The enjoyable part would be next. And then you would think, okay, what actually makes my life enjoyable? And you would focus on those things, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the case of like, when we talk about fire is people did that and they examined their life and it was like, okay, the money isn't gonna help me, Yeah. right? What's truly valuable to me is my free time and spending time with my family and my friends doing the things I like, right? So I'm gonna trade off money for free time and for early retirement, right? Yeah. yeah. That's fundamental thinking. Mm -hmm. when, what most people do is they look at what other people do, right? They mm -hmm. look yeah. at what yeah. people do, what other people want, um, and then they kind of just follow the crowd, right? 
So it's kind of even a way of lateral thinking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's comparative thinking. They're not thinking down to the roots. Right? This kind of reminds me back in, this is probably like almost 10 years ago, I was living with some roommates. And I think I was like having an existential crisis. Like this was around the time I lost faith in religion. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to like figure out the meaning of existence. And I think I asked one of my friends. You figured that. it out? I asked one of my roommates that. He's like, I don't know. I just do what other people do. And I was like, that's the perfect example of like lateral. Wow. Like, thinking that's uh, that's other people. Yeah. Okay. That's the first time I heard um, those terms, lateral thinking. And well, I'm making that shit up. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, like, I'm gonna steal that. That's really good. <laughs> You'll steal it. Spread it. Make it a meme. <laughs> it's not a meme. It's gonna be legitimate, dude. <laughs> a meme is legitimate. You know <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. A meme is legitimate. Right. That's fair. Like Richard Dawkins, I think. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, which book was it? The The Selfish Gene. I think that's yeah. where it came from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah I, I, so I think that's why. Um, and I guess I I did that shift, right? I did that shift into looking at what really matters in my life. That's how I came across like um, fire. Like I did a lot of like thinking, I guess, philosophically about mm, how my life should be and building it from the ground up, mm -hmm. rather than just simply shifting to what other people are doing. Um, yeah, and then so I came across, you know, the fire movement, and I came across like longevity and all this jazz, right? All that jazz. That makes a lot of sense. And I would say that you are not the norm, right? Like you said, most people think laterally. Most people are looking at other people to tell them how to live, like how, what determines their happiness a lot of times is just what, what other people do, right? And that's how trends get started. That's how things become viral is like people like to i feel like people like to be part of something right so if if uh everyone is suddenly wearing like one type of shoe or suddenly everyone's getting the same kind of haircut um you want to fit in you want to be part of that and street was it streetwear streetwear yeah yeah fashion right fashion is itself. that not a thing Oh, of course, of course, yeah. That's that's never going away. I don't think. I remember when we, when we were in New York and we were looking at these shoes and we we're looking at these stores. I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" I I remember you guys were talking about like Nat Geo bags or something. I was like, "When did Nat Geo become cool?" <laughs> yeah, that's the funny thing. I don't think it ever became cool here, but uh, it's because we went to Korea <laughs> earlier that year, and every Korea is the best example, by the way, of this lateral thinking you're describing. This is a phenomenon I've only seen in Korea, but like you will see a group of guys or a group of girls, at least I'm talking five to 10, right? And they're wearing the exact same thing. Like, I don't mean like the same color, same style. They're literally wearing the same item from head to toe. And it's like, they look, this, they have the same haircut. They have the exact same style. There's 10 of them. How do they even tell each other apart? You know? <laughs> and then Korea- That's racist, Jack. <laughs> Korea is like this example of um, groupthink, this like herd mentality taken to the most extreme where like fashion in Korea is so rigid. It's like, if this is trendy, you, everyone must be, everyone must wear this. And like, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm just imagining that they're like the Akatsuki from uh, Naruto. <laughs> Dude, by, by the way, like you're, you're, that's not that far off. Like, I'm not even joking. Like the streetwear looks like that, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's just the fact that they're all wearing the same thing. So like any, anytime you, if you're all coordinated, it always looks like a fucking uniform or something. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> these guys must be some kind of group. Like, but yeah, um, I thought that was pretty ridiculous. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I guess go, going back to our topic for longevity, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, I, I guess it's like a societal thing, like where people needs, like we talked about this before, I think when we talked about the social dilemma, and probably even other times, even with the racism thing, right? Remember how, we talked about how people don't really look at data? Yes. Right? They look at headlines, and that's why like basically stop reading these uh, headlines and articles yeah. in mainstream media for the most part because they don't really tell the truth. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. And so if you're just going along by that, you're probably never coming to the truth, right? Or the truth will come to you and you'll be like the last people, last people to know, right? But if you go and really search these things out and try to learn how to understand them, um, then, then you can be like uh, ahead of the trend and um, if it means living longer, then that's quite a quite a reward for doing that, right? 
Yes, that, that's very true. Um, I think the hard part is for people to break away from that kind of thinking, right? Um, I think it's easy for you and me to be on this side and say like, oh, like don't be so caught up by the headlines and what other people are saying or thinking. Do your own research, be, like think for yourself. We actually hear that a lot, like even now, right? And those words often come from the biggest hurt, like sheep kind of thinking people. Like, a lot of people who say do your own research, oftentimes <laughs> they're the people who are buying into conspiracy theories. <laughs> and like, <laughs> uh, and so it's a little scary because um, it seems like just doing your own research is not enough. You, you need to research the right way and you need to be really careful that you don't taint your own research with your own biases and go down a path of radicalism or, or conspiracy theories, you know, like that kind of stuff. That's true. And I think it's a fine line to walk, right? Like even now, like, you know, I've told you, like, I've gone into crypto recently and like all this like longevity stuff. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, I could be totally wrong. I could just be like, they could have me for a ride right now. Like, right? Like, <laughs> Dude, um, if, if, Bitcoin, if, that, if you right? if you get the whole group to get into Bitcoin and then it crashes, <laughs> see. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> just feel like is not investment this, this is not financial advice, guys. I just like this, this coin. <laughs> I'm smooth brain. Actually, oh my god, dude! I, smooth in brain. fact, um, today we actually had a lecture on brain development in kids. Yeah, there is a condition that causes you to have smooth. Brain. <laughs> Do people start laughing when brain. when that was brought up? No, but like I, I usually felt bad actually. I was like, oh my god, these people, like everyone in the internet is like, oh, smooth brain, smooth brain, and like there's actually a medical condition that does. <laughs> so I should probably stop using this as an example. Does um, <laughs> does it actually affect your IQ? I believe so. Yikes! I don't think we went super in depth into it, but like we saw images and stuff, and like the name for this condition, I think it's called uh, list in list encephalopathy or list encephaly, list encephaly. Okay. Um, so L I S S E N uh, C wait, E E N C E T H A L Y. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not but literally that. like the brain doesn't really have folds, right? It's kind of like a really smooth. Can I <laughs> Google this? Is that a you can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> What's it? Go to the show notes. Spell that one more time. <laughs> Yeah, let me uh, uh, let me Google this for you, and I'll just link you. <laughs> that's that's quite interesting. Today I learned. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else were we talking about, though? Okay, I guess we can move on to talking about like the last part of Dave Sinclair's book, right? Yeah. Which is about the social implications for all of this. Um. Oh no. It's been a while since I've read the book, so why don't you start off? Sorry, I'm just looking at these images. And <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty smooth and then there's just a picture of a dog and i'm just like oh no <laughs> this is fully in dog sorry anyways getting off topic um yeah okay so to to be honest when i started reading this part i was more i was also kind of imagine like thinking about it from my own perspective as well um but yeah i think some of the things that he he mentioned uh or the, the biggest thing that he mentioned was something called a a peace, a peace dividend, I believe. Um, which is he? He's arguing that a lot of the wars being fought, um, or sorry, not not wars. He's arguing that um, no, no, no. He, he's talking about like he's talking about the war in the sense of the, of the age-related diseases. I think he's saying that okay. society itself will save so much money. I think he he was arguing the numbers of trillions alone just from people's lifespans expanding or uh, extending, right? Um, and he also talked about uh, the downsides of it, which would be like more consumption leading to more waste, more environmental damage, right? Um, <clears throat> and I can't really remember the other things that he mentioned. Um, probably should have taken some notes actually, on this, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think those are the big points that he had. And um, the second part is what I was thinking about too, is like the, the first thing I thought about was what, what would be the implications, what would be the downside of everyone living longer, right? One, like a few people, a few select people who live past 100, that's, that's an anomaly, that's fine. That's not gonna affect anything on a worldwide scale. But if society as a whole starts living 20, 30 years longer than um, we used to, there, there's definitely gonna be some 
long-term impact, right? And we probably have to change some of the things that we're doing, even though they're like, Nowadays, we people are more environmentally conscious, but I would argue we might have to change even more to accommodate that. Probably, um, yeah. So societal impact, like I, I, I'm personally, I think leaning towards the <clears throat> argument that if this becomes a reality, society will adapt. Mm -hmm. right? So I think you talked about the example of the Malthusian time bomb. So like the pop overpopulation time bomb, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This was back, oh, this was a long time ago, right? Where, where they first started talking about this. I think, was it Thomas Malthus was like the scientist and he, I think he studied like the population ecological patterns of like different uh, species of animals and how like the population would explode if you put them in this like resource rich uh, environment, I think. And then they would like, their growth would outpace the replenishment of resources. And then right, they, right. they, then they completely crash yeah yeah um yeah and that never happened even though population is the highest it's ever been now right um i think humans have adapted through technology and even i guess if you think about the fact that as living conditions have gotten better birth rates have gone down right so um that might happen honestly yeah, yeah. i guess i don't know what the future will look like i i i I think obviously it benefits everyone. I think one giant concern I had immediately was about access to um, to whatever drugs come out. That does it does it benefit them. everyone? I'm curious. Um... Well, okay. So first of all, I guess think about the stuff that they have out, right? I don't know how much like NAD supplements or resveratrol or like yeah, what those those cost, right? But metformin is like dirt cheap. True. True. Um, and uh what's the other one rapamycin is another one i think that's of interest uh, but don't you I think, think if there is a cultural shift in how we value these supplements the demand's going to increase and the price will be adjusted appropriately yeah but like metform is off patent right i think oh gotcha so okay. yeah so you just create generics and at that mm. point if it becomes such high demand the government can just come in right and take it off patents if they want to right they can take it off protection um, yeah that's i mean i don't have faith in, in the in the u.s government in particular to step in the interest of consumers just based on history i mean like think about it china will counterfeit the shit out of this right <laughs> india at that point will, will they the Do you, this does the too. ccp want its people to live longer i'm curious <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, don't 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 get us killed here. <laughs> um, Not before Audible sponsorship. But, but yeah, like that's one thing I jumped to, and at first I had that worry, and I think I thought about like the drugs that they've mentioned so far, and they're all dirt cheap. So I think mm. that's fine for now. But if new things come out, then potentially it can get very expensive, and yeah. it can become unaffordable. And I think yeah. my concern would be who gets it, right? Um, because like my thought was, I think we know who gets it. it. Yeah. Jeff <laughs> Bezos. Um, but I, I think tracing back my line of thought, right. Which is from sort of like the, yeah, let's, let's say, talk about fire for a moment. Right. Sure. Which is like you, you, um, you, you value your time over the money that you're earning. Right. So therefore you retire early. Right. Yeah. And if, if then expensive drug comes out that makes you live longer, then the math, then the trade-off, I think, tells you that you should go back to work to earn that money to get that, right? Uh, um, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but that's not really the point. I think the point I was getting at, trying to get at through that is that money hasn't been able to buy you longevity before. And that was really the great equalizer. Yes, Right. yes, Was that absolutely. We could all be roughly the same amount of happiness, right? Like, I like, talked about how money doesn't buy you happiness, yes. right? And so and if we all have the same amount of time, and if our lives value and what we truly value is happiness times time right and money doesn't buy you happiness money doesn't buy you time right then that's not really a problem right but the moment when money can buy either of those right so when money when money can buy time now you shifted the calculus right like mm -hmm. like death is a great equalizer and if we remove it as the great equalizer i think there'll be a lot more unhappy people in that 
if a select few get to live really long, right? Before you could say like, oh, well, that, that guy, he dies anyways, right? Like we still live the same amount of time, right? Now, if, if you can't say that anymore, I can, I can imagine a huge amount of resentment. Interesting. I probably personally would have a lot of resentment. So you think <laughs> the unhappiness will come from the fact that, um, will, yeah, will come from the resentment, from a jealousy of not being able to live longer. I think if you think about it from the first principles way of thinking that I laid out, yes. Now, if you were just thinking about it, like as people do now, which, which I, you know, I coined as lateral. Lateral. Thinking. How about smooth? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <Lateral>. <laughs> smooth thinking yeah. um, but uh yeah then then things might be different right because i don't know what people value exactly but i think if you think about the first principle perspective then this becomes a huge problem mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. you know like what truly matters in life is happiness times time if you can buy either one of those right then it becomes a huge problem i think I totally agree with that. I mean, that. it can buy already in some 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 way, right? It can buy in the fact that you can retire early, for example, right? But that... <clears throat> how they it? No, I mean, I, I get what you're getting at. Like like you said, like, yeah. there's, it doesn't... Aff- you have more time, but it doesn't affect the total amount of time that you had. You know what I mean? Like, you, you freed up more of your remaining mm-hmm. time, but... Mm-hmm. And like it's like at the end of the day, you 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 could you could see this man that's living an ultra privileged life, but it's like in the we all die just the same, right? And you if you remove yeah. that factor, sure, I can see that. And um, like there's there are lots of sayings, right? Like people saying like that, like even the richest guys still have to poop or whatever, right? Right, right. I mean, unless you're Kim Jong Il or like Kim Jong Un, right? Like I think there was a. They had like propaganda thing that he doesn't even fart. Yeah, like, wasn't it? Like he doesn't no, even have a butthole. No I think anus. that was. Yeah, he has no anus. Like... <laughs> Guys, that just means he poops out his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's worse. <laughs> hilarious. Um, yeah. Okay. What you brought up there is super, I think, relevant. Um, and I've 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 mentioned this before, but there is this show called Altered Carbon, which is a sci-fi show based on a book series that explores the concept of immortality actually to a degree um and i think i told you like if you if you have time you should give it a watch i know you say you don't really watch fiction anymore but i think the first season does tackle a lot of these topics and i think you might find them interesting but i can tell you quickly like this like kind of summarize the bigger points is um imagine a society where you have the technology to re like place your consciousness into uh, another body right so this will lead to rich people having an infinite supply of bodies uh, or rather clones of themselves. In fact, it can be of anyone they want, right? They can, they can just remake themselves in any image they see fit because they can put their mind into any, any body. And that's, that's one of the themes in the show is like uh, the ultra rich, like, like wh- what they choose to present themselves as when you have theoretically, like when you can literally choose your face like an RPG game, right? Like, um, and they explore this concept of, of how if... if no, this is taken to the extreme because these people are immortal in a sense, right? Like you can produce an infinite supply of clones and uh, essentially never run out of bodies for yourself. And you can have backups of your consciousness so that if the one in your real body is destroyed, you have a backup that you lose like a day's worth of memories, right? And what we see from this is like the, a, a huge examples of, of class divide, right? Um, the, the ultra rich, the, I forget that there's a term for them, but the ultra rich who've essentially been able to live immortally, literally, uh, have evacuated themselves from the surface and they live like up essentially in heaven, right? Like that's the metaphor here. Uh, and they, they kind of play God. They even dress as like, uh, ancient Greeks or Romans. And the whole idea is to kind of show you how, because they've removed this great equalizer, these humans, the few privileged, rich, ultra wealthy, are now essentially the same as gods. There's literally no difference anymore, right? And that's what they view themselves as. Now, let's go back to what we're discussing right here. What what you said. Um, obviously, it's not going to be to that extreme because it's not like these people will live forever. But do you think there's going to be a shift towards how the wealthy? Do you think there will be even more of a divide between? between classes because of this extra factor that that can be um used to segregate you which is your lifespan 
Yeah, complicated. Um, if it's yeah, if if uh, immortality is purchasable, and if it's if there's a high barrier to that purchase, meaning the price is really high. Yeah. Then, yes, there will be a divide. Now, hmm. Well, let's scratch immortality for a second. Let's just talk about hypothetically, you know, let's use that magic number, 150. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's say, let's say it costs a million dollars for the drug regimen. Uh, let's say it costs a million dollars a year. That puts quite a high barrier on this, right? Yeah. Um, one oh, million dollars a year? Dude, look. It's rookie yeah. numbers, man. You but should see how much I lose in my portfolio on the daily. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, go on. Going, yeah, I going out to one hundred and fifty. That, how many people can truly purchase that? Quite little amounts of people, right? Quite little. Um, quite little. Yeah, and it, yeah, and I just think that the resentment will be even greater <clears throat> than the wealth, wealth, uh, inequality resentment that we see currently. Yeah, I I agree with Again, that. It's that thing, right? Like where, for example, I'm fucking poor, <laughs> and like. You know, if I see, let's for example, someone driving a Ferrari around, I'd be like, "What a sucker!" Right? Spend his money on that shit, like you know, like <laughs> that doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Right? But if I saw a guy walking around and like he's like one one forty and he looks like he's like six years old, right? I'd be like, "Fuck!" <laughs> now I'm jealous, right? That's a, that's fair. So I think that would probably create more resentment. And what would happen? Like I, I don't know what would happen. Um. First of all, they're definitely paying a lot of money for this, right? So their wealth will be going down. Um, but at the same time, they have more time to accumulate wealth. Yes, yes. So I think some extreme rich people will get extremely wealthy. I think the people who are on the borderline barely able to afford this treatment, right? They will not become more more wealthy but they will true, have more time. true. There, there's a bit of a yeah. tipping point yeah it's like yeah some for some people they can absorb this one million loss a- annually and make it back tenfold mm-hmm. for some people this is gonna be around the edge of like yeah yeah it's, it's fair yeah um and i think an economy will build be, will be built up around this right yeah an economy will be built up around the, the supply of these things and like i don't know services for this ultra old I don't know what kind of special service they will enjoy. Maybe there's something to be worked out there. Um, and I also think though, and, and here's the thing, right? Like if, even if you cure aging or even if you slow down aging, you can still die through trauma. Mm-hmm. Right? That, that drug isn't helping you with your bullet wound, right? So I can see- oh, I like where this is going. Brutal- we're, we're, I can see really disgruntled people just going out to assassinate people. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I, yeah. They will. They will view themselves as martyrs. Yeah, something like that. And, um, yeah, like these guys probably spent a shit ton on security. Oh yeah. Yes, because yeah. that's that's the only thing that could harm them at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I think of that as being really interesting, and it definitely changes the risks. I mean, I don't think many people are thinking about their lives in terms of like risks and stuff, in terms of like, oh, what are the ways that I can die? What are the probabilities? And like, how do I, like, what's the best way for me to mitigate those risks? I don't think most people think about that way. Exactly, yeah. But it's definitely going to make risk risk mitigation in, the, in terms of like physical uh, injuries more much more important to people. So the bright side is, um, like, if we, if we accept David Sinclair's argument that, you know, um, improving extending people's lifespan will save trillions of money in healthcare in terms of fighting age-related diseases then this kind of money can be better spent going into physical uh sorry i don't know the term for it but like treatment of physical trauma or wounds so to speak do you think that can help kind of mitigate the i don't think it saves money in age-related diseases you're still going to get them at some point like if you're going to get them at 150 you're still going to get them at 150 right and so the, mm-hmm. the only true. way to reduce that would be like literally we have less people growing up, right? Do, do you yeah, know what I mean? The true. rate, uh, I guess the rate, like uh, if fertility rates go down, right? If birth rates go down, I think mm-hmm. that's the only way you would actually prevent it. Because now you're prolonging, like let's say we're like generation crashing waves into death, right? 
and when they hit like this here that's when they get easily disease when they hit the end of my screen is when they die right mm -hmm. so what they'll do is they stretch out the screen right? I, I know but it doesn't mean. change the frequency of the like, wave yeah eventually the throughput is the same yeah the throughput still is the same yeah and so in that sense i don't think it really saves you money unless you basically have less people right like less people being born mm. yeah that's um, fair that's fair yeah hmm I want to go back before I forget this. Um, so you brought up two very great points. You brought up how uh, fire is a natural result of looking at life from a first principles perspective and realizing that your happiness ult ultimately comes down to time, time multiplied by happiness or whatever. Um, and you said like, for example, if suddenly money was a factor in prolong your lifespan, then that changes the math for fire right so let's go back to this hypothetical world where you can spend a ton of money to expend extend your life a great amount then would you would that change how you like would, would, would you not even fire in that case yeah i mean it has to be a risk uh it has to be like a cost benefit analysis and mm -hmm. it's really difficult to calculate um because you basically so, have to yeah. say, I mean, I'm you trying to... Have to say, how much money do I need, right, to earn extra years? Yes, right? yes. What's the probability of me being able to earn that money? How long would it take for me to earn that money? How much stress would that induce, right? So how much of that mm -hmm. is taking away from my happiness times time anyways, right? And then mm -hmm. you have to try to make that break even, basically. And if it's at a million dollars a year, that's going to be really tough. Like, most people are not going to be able to do that, right? Like... How many jobs pay a million dollars a year? <laughs> right? How many can actually do that? Like, I think I'm probably in a fortunate enough position where I can probably work to get that, to get to that stage, right? But I think vast majority of people can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, if in fact, if the popular, if the competition for those kind of positions and stuff really ramp up, I probably can't even get it anyways. <laughs> um, yeah. Even though I think of myself as like being like quite smart and capable like i probably can't compete with all these other people right so, you mean compete in terms of compete for basic jobs that can pay that much that, I see. that amount of money i see yeah right so you're like, saying like the I, demand all the, all the all the fire people are going to come out of retirement <laughs> oh okay okay yeah yeah the demand for and, and these higher other people jobs are going to work harder to do it right yeah, you're right, you're right. If that can become a goal, right? If you're right now like, oh, my life is good, you know, I, I'm earning the money that I need to spend, but then all of a sudden they dangle this thing in front of you where it's like, oh, you can live 50, 60 years longer, right? If you if you are able to make this amount of money, that changes the calculation for everyone, right? True, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's something to think about for sure. Yeah, like I'm, I, I'm just keeping these things in mind and doing the calculation later. And also, you know what? I don't I even think you I... can do the calculation right now. There's just not enough information to base off of, right? Yeah, or at least an estimate. Yeah, and like I, I kind of mentioned that like maybe I'd be able to make a million dollars a year. Like even that is quite far fetched, right? Mm -hmm. So like, oh, I think what do you I mean, man? I'm, I'm waiting, dude. Anyway, I'm, I'm waiting for you. To, Sorry, I'm waiting for you to <laughs> hit that one million a year and. <laughs> Don't forget your don't forget your podcast partner. When you're, when you're <laughs> this, this is the way we're making that million. Oh, dollars. let's go! That's what I like to hear. <laughs> it all nice. starts with an audible sponsorship. <laughs> but, uh, um, what, what we were we getting at? Um, yeah, no, I think the discussion about the societal impl implications was all really, really good. Do you think there's anything we missed? Not really. I think I think the the one thing that's all just on my mind with this right is the idea of death being the great equalizer, mm -hmm. and what happens when you remove that. I think it's gonna be f fucking bananas, <laughs> um, and yeah. I hope that the technology doesn't cost a lot of money, right? Um, but let's be honest, it it has to. When it first comes out, it must. Yeah, I mean, it really depends, right? It depends on what the technology is and like how hard it is to uh, replicate it. <clears throat> and also whether or not governments will literally just step in, right? Do you know what I mean? And just basically make them a utility, like make them a public good. 
Yeah. So here's my theory on that. Um, if this were ever to happen, uh, my my first reaction would be I don't think governments will be as uh, utilitarian as to say, oh, this is something that will benefit everybody. Let's put it out there for you for free. I think money. The political will in democratic society is going to be so high, right? If only, mm. let's say, 0.1% of the population can get it. And you're still in a democratic society with 99.9% other percent of the population voting against you. That's going to be tough. But has that, I don't feel like that stopped the U.S. before, <laughs> you know? I feel like... I think that's because it hasn't dealt with something just literally so... Mm, so essential to life, like just yeah. so close, right, to life, and that that touches everyone's heartstrings. That's right? true. That's true. Like you that's have an a lot of things example. divide you, right? You have a lot of things divide you, right? Like yeah. let's say minimum wage. Well, a lot of people don't make minimum wage, so they probably don't care as much, right? Or let's say climate change, where your job is in oil and gas, for example, <laughs> right? Or I don't know, like lots of different things, right? But if, like, I think this is something that's like just categorically different from all those things. You're saying this is not a divisive issue. Like everybody should be united in terms of supporting, like everybody wants to live longer, right? I think it's going to not be that divisive. Um, if, if it comes down to like, the government has a way to nationalize this technology, I don't think it's going to be that divisive. Let me ask you, did you like, expect like, wearing masks to be divisive? Well, I think that's different in that... Mm, okay, let's say that this drug came out. Some people believe that this drug gave you autism instead. Yeah, okay, exactly. I, exactly. I, I, I think you're underestimating the ability of... I'll say the media. The ability of the media to portray things from a bipartisan point of view, especially in the U.S., they're very, very good at... They're very, very good at dividing people, straight up. That's, 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 that's right, manufacturing, point. like, division. Exactly, yes. Like, um, literally, the same, the same event will be um, interpreted very differently depending on where what source you read, right? And that's by design. So you can expect a lot of... A, hit pieces against this technology when it comes out. First of all, um, there's always going to be resistance towards emerging new technology. There's always going to be some level of fear, like we haven't done enough research, what are the long-term side effects, right? Especially when you present it in such a, a fashion, like, hey, this is a magical pill that'll make you live longer. People will be skeptical. There will be like, there was, okay, what's the cash, right? Like, you know? So I think it will be more divisive than, than you expect at first. I think it will take some time for people to accept. It will take, it will take some empirical evidence of I think like notable people using it and showing like, hey, like, you know, this is, and, and then seeing the results of it. Now in this case, I think it's good because you can clearly see the results of someone living to 150, right? That that's that's kind of a big deal. There are other ways too, right? Like there are ways to measure your kind of genetic age, like epigenetic age. But I don't. I, do you think that's enough to? turn the attention yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. Not. like you, yeah. you, you need some you, you need something Jeff Bezos, yeah but you, if you still see Bezos in like 21 12 you'll be like yeah something's up <laughs> right right that's something that you can be like wait a minute like, you know <laughs> so I, I think eventually it'll get there where um this will become a free uh, I hope this will become a free standard for for all people right um but I do think it'll there there's always resistance like I think you can kind of tell now, whenever we talk about emerging new technologies, I, I always bring up a lot of skepticism, and it's because I feel like traditional institutions have always been resistant to change in almost any field. And I can think of so many examples, um, and this might be particularly relevant to me because I work in tech, and I feel like tech is, the, the whole point of tech is to just disrupt your uh, current existing tools with with new ones right and a lot of times you'll see the resistance and it always comes down to politics or money or simply people don't want to adopt new things right so that's that's where the skepticism comes from me that's true and i probably should be more skeptical because this is probably not a bigger problem in any other field 
compared to medicine. That's fair. I think, that's the, fair. I think the stat is that new research that's like proven effective uh, takes 17 years for adoption, I think, in, in medicine. Wow. Yeah. 17 years. 16 or, seven, 16 or 17 years is, is the average, I think. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, Alberta, we're just moving to electronic me electronic medical records right now. <sighs> oh, that's... <laughs> Actually, I'm not surprised. I, it seems to me like um, uh, bookkeeping is especially outdated in a surprising number of fields outside of tech. Yeah, and you know, like things we're talking about now probably won't permeate through to like um, the medical establishment for ten to twenty years. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot, I think a lot of the ways, a lot of the ways we do things in medicine are pretty old and take a long time to change. I think that's getting better with my generation, but like, I, 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 I just have so much, I guess, optimism about this generation. You know, I think they've changed the selection criteria so much to get mm -hmm. people who are not just like book smart and well connected and whatever. Right. But also have a lot of these kind of like extra attributes, right. In terms of like their passion for, uh, social social stuff like social justice or uh, moving science faster like we literally have clubs around that right mm. around like how to uh translate uh lab findings into like cl clinical settings and things like that but yeah we'll, we'll see i think there is definitely a lot of entrenched interest and stuff too like i can definitely imagine old dog i can imagine myself right like if someone comes with an AI that replaces me, I'd be like, nope, not on my watch. Give me another 10 years. <laughs> right? I can totally do that. I'm just imagining you <laughs> holding a sign like an anti-AI rally. It's like, we do not want to be replaced. <laughs> that way, yeah, robots. Totally. Except it, it will probably be framed in some other way. It will probably be framed in like, oh, AI is not safe. Yeah, you know, true, like, true. Yeah. It's going to be like a picture of like iRobot, like Terminator or whatever, <laughs> with like the yeah. red circle X. Like. <laughs> Speaking of which, actually, I'm getting like uh, a lot more back into AI recently. Mm. Like I basically put it off for a couple of years um, after I got to med school because I thought, I was just going to do clinical stuff that, you know, this is, this is my past kind of thing. And yeah. I was disappointed with like the progress of AI anyways. That's too slow. But I think... I think nowadays I think about how, um, like, I really want a hybrid career kind of thing. I, I want mm. my career to be not just clinical, but like all sorts. And it's also like a way to diversify and hedge against the risk of being replaced, right? Um, like, if tech is coming from my field, well, I want to be the one to, like, have a say in that, like, to direct that. Is that a legitimate concern in healthcare? Is that tech is actually going to replace, like, everything? I mean, you just told me that you guys switched to electronic bookkeeping like this year. Yeah, yeah, we just switched, but mm, how do I put it? I think there is fear. I think there's a lot of fear among like the medical students. Um, I think every every new class that comes in, they're like, oh my God, oh my God, what's going to happen? Because our training so long, right? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> Later, I see like, what you're getting. At. <laughs> oh my god! What's that meme of like the very like really unlucky dude? It's like the just imagine like this guy's face. It's like the, Brian or something. Yeah, right? yeah. It's like the the, yeah, the day exactly. he graduates. It's like his that face is like your your job's been overtaken by AI. <laughs> like I think that literally is a concern. Um, oh my goodness! At least for me. <laughs> I, I never, I gotta be honest, I, I just never thought about that, but that's, I think that's valid. And that must be a concern in so many industries, especially, um, like they've been talking about replacing um, like restaurant workers for years, right, with AI and McDonald's already did some pilot studies, I think on this. So there, there's definitely some legitimate concern, yeah. I mean, I guess the good thing is that it, it's taken so long, right? yeah. that, that adoption has been so long. I think, I think honestly, I probably should have nothing to worry. I think my generation- I don't think you have anything to worry. Maybe, maybe our kids, maybe I our think kids. Adoption, I think adoption is going to take at least like 20, 30 years, you know, if not longer. Yeah. And Imagine. this is going to, this is going to have so much resistance. Like, like you already said, like this is going to be met with so much resistance everywhere. Yeah. And at first it's going to be, um, like AI assisting you, 
Yes. So it's not replacing you. In fact, at the beginning, it probably help you, right? Yeah. It'll probably make you more productive. Agreed, agreed. And then slowly replaces you. And I think full replacement, if I were to put a number on it, probably like 50 years. It's, so, I think you're right. It's going to be gradual. It's going to start with downsizing. Like you're just going to have less and less physical people on your team as time goes by. And it's going to feel natural until one day it's like, wait a minute, where's all the human colleagues, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute. I'm no longer. <laughs> Yeah. I'm ultra carbon. No, no. Yeah. But um <laughs> yeah, that's a super cool topic that we should talk about yeah, next uh, episode or or something. Um getting yeah, back to that, getting back to lifespan real quick. Crazy. Um I think we did cover pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. There was one thing that I wanted to bring up. Um it was kind of related to what I said earlier about like, why do you think more people aren't doing the, these type of things, such as exercising, intermittent fasting, like if it's so easy and if it has such great benefits. And like you said, like people just aren't aware of like these things and are not even aware. People just don't think about it in terms of this can increase my lifespan, right? Like this is the first, the first order of thinking, so to speak. Um, this is not necessarily related to lifespan, but I just want to expand more on this in general is like the the lateral the lateral thinking uh, that you have coined right that that is so common so prevalent within society um, how do you get people to stop doing that like I guess I have a theory around that so like my theory around that would be why I don't think that way is probably because I've had so many experiences that shook up my world. Mm-hmm. Right, which required me to think harder, hard about how life is. Right, and I and another aspect of it, I think, is probably I never really got settled in, um, like because I moved around so much as a kid. Like I don't think I really got settled into a certain rhythm in life where I'm just comfortable. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of the key: is that if everything's just working out for you enough that you're always comfortable, you're probably not going to try to explore more. Right? Do you know? Do you understand what I mean? I do know. Yeah. 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 So I think. You need to have a certain drive to do it. You need to have a reason to do it, right? Like, I would never have thought about, mm, like, for example, religion, right? Had I not had that existential crisis, right? And what made me think about, like, what made me really drawn to fire was probably, like, I was thinking about how to replace that worldview, replace that worldview of religion with something else. And at the time, I had, like, <clears throat> like taken a philosophy class on ethics, and I was really drawn to utilitarianism, right? And I think you can see how that fits really well with like fire is is breaking things down and thinking about things on the, like kind of you know ground way up. And the like, utilitarianism, I think, it's like kind of really contrary to lateral thinking, right? Yeah. Because utilitarian utilitarianism is basically saying it's breaking things down to the basic element, right, of what matters, mm-hmm. and then going from there. So. Like where that all come from is from the discontentment, right? From from having my worldview shaken up. Mm, okay. And I think if if I, I think most people probably don't experience those things very much. Like they brought their they they grow up and they're brought up in like this this environment that's kind of set and that's kind of stable throughout their life, right? And as long as that environment <clears throat> works for them, I don't think that's going. I don't think they're gonna have the motivation to try to seek something else out, right? I, like that's why I think when I look at people, mm, these like really successful people, it, it feels like they always have like, you know, way a tragic backstory, right? Mm-hmm. They seem to always come from somewhere that's like, that created that drive, right? They they always came from some unhappy beginning that created that drive, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? I I think that's probably the solution to lateral thinking. Um, have a tragic yeah. backstory. Is to experience some level of pain that that caught that motivates you to go and seek something else out, mm-hmm. right? To not surround yourself in this comfortable bubble. Um, maybe it has to do with parenting too, right? Maybe it has to do with like how much freedom you were allowed as a kid, right? To to really explore and think on your own. So, for example, when I grew up, right? Like I told you, like I moved around a lot, and also my parents were really busy. So, when we first moved to the UK, my, my mom worked like from morning till about 9 to 10 p.m. And I basically just take care of myself after I come home from school, right? Mm-hmm. And this was when I was like 9, 10, etc., like-ish. Um, and my dad was in a different city working. So I just had a lot of free time. 
Um, and my parents never bugged me about school, basically. They never really bugged me about anything. So I, was, I had a lot of freedom to, I guess, think on my own. I, and like, I don't know, that's just my own experience. And like, what I see seems to be that like, a lot of successful people have bad experiences that motivate them. So I wonder if that's sort of like a, a pattern Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I'll take it a slight step further and say that a lot of this comfort that you say we experience in our daily lives, like before we experience some kind of pain or hardship or in your case, just circumstances in your childhood never let you get settled into that comfortable pacing. I would say like this. In, this, I mean, bad things also happen, but we'll save that for another time. Among other things, <laughs> among other things. Um yeah, I'm gonna say like society in general tries to actively keep you in this comfortable bubble. Um, I think a lot of the things that society provides in it comes in the form of entertainment um, for you, right? It's it's kind of ways to help you pass the time and relieve stress. Like you, you kind of turn your brain off when it comes. Like, and you touched on this before how it's like empty calorie consumption in a way, right? Like games, media. Um, sports to a degree like these things don't really have any long-term value but they provide some short-term entertainment relief and it's enough for you to it's it's enough that's the point it's enough for most people to have this it hits those those uh spots in your brain right like it's uh, enough so that you're so you're comfortable enough that you don't think about what's more out there you don't think about you're not trying to dig deeper as you're saying right so I think a lot of it, yes, yeah, so straight up society is uh, fighting against you in this regard. In a way, it's almost like the Matrix, right? Like you're trying to break free from the programming of the machines and, oh my God, that movie is so ahead of its time. But anyways, it's just... <laughs> it... Do you remember at one point, one of the agents, right? I think, oh no, one of the humans, mm-hmm. right? Basically backs up the other yep. humans. Yep, because he, wants, he, he yeah. wanted to go back to the paradise. He, he knew it was fake, but he was yeah. like, you know what? This is better than real life. Fuck it. And actually this concept we're talking about of like uh, manufactured comfort to keep you within a certain uh, state, right? Comfort, comfort, comfort state. Oh my God, you should read uh, Brave New World. Have you read that book? Oh yeah, okay, a classic, yes. But so long ago that it might be worth rereading to be honest. This was like high school and I read it on my own. We didn't study it, I just read it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, like one of my favorite books. Um, I think I read it in the time when I was going through that existential crisis mm-hmm. and I was like, like it, it blew my mind um and yeah you just talk about the, the exact same thing that happens in that book right yeah, they have these yeah. like orchestras and orgies and like yeah. these things that they set up right yeah to meet all those needs right i, I like I, I was i'm rereading it with my uh fiance actually no way dope yeah uh, and actually like one i think i remember one passage they talk about is like this buildup of energy so they talk about like say a hose right mm-hmm. if you just keep letting the water run it doesn't build up pressure right but if you let the pressure build up, then it can burst. And so it's it's human emotions, right? So what we're doing is we're releasing those emotions. We're meeting those needs through these entertainment, mm-hmm. right? We're not letting it build up enough to give us motivation to change something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because yep. all the energy that's providing, right? All that discontentment, we instantly discharge it, right? And by the way, sorry, I, I, I was focusing on society, but this doesn't just apply to that. Like, I think one of the most common things it's going to apply to is relationships. Uh, a lot of times people will find themselves stuck in an unhappy relationship, but they don't want to change it because they got comfortable being in a relationship. And the thought of being single or, or alone scares them even more than being in this unhappy relationship. I can think of so many examples of this personally and just from, you know, like what, what, what you hear um, or what you read about. Um, so I think this whole idea of breaking out of your comfort zone is something that we have to actively train ourselves to do, um, because we've been conditioned our lives to just accept what we have. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah, I think there are kind of two approaches to it, right? Like, I think I'm fortunate slash unfortunate enough to have had experiences that, um, gave me enough motivation to change things. Yeah. And that basically gave me that habit to be able to see things, uh, examine things from like a third perspective and then like change things, right? 
the other way to do that. So I'm, so at the beginning, that was motivated through emotions generated through an external source. Do you, do you kind of follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other way to do that is for it to come from your, you said your frontal cortex, right? In your brain, like mm-hmm. the, the part that uh, makes decisions and tries to be rational, right? Mm-hmm. Is using what you've learned essentially, right? To, to change your behavior. So there's no emotional stimulus, but you can do it through like your frontal cortex. And, you know, that can only be done when you're like an older adult, like past well, 25, probably after your well, frontal cortex is fully mature. Yeah, but, when you can think more rationally yeah yeah when you can do these analysis and, and say like hey this is this doesn't make sense right there are two ways to get out of that relationship right one is for it to get so bad yes yeah you're right, right. You yeah. Want to- it has to right. it has to reach the, the tipping point yeah tipping point and most people like like you said like if you keep on discharging that discontentment through entertainment or like other outlets you never build up enough force, yeah right? in the case of this relationship let's say like you guys fight all the time but then, um, you know, you make up through like sex or like you go on a date and you, you, you do something that you're used to doing that you kind of reset the, the discontent, right? Until the next time you fight, basically. Yeah, exactly. Like this happens so much in dysfunctional households, right? Like this is exactly like this is basically their MO. Like this is exactly how they do things. Yes, yes. Um, and then the other way, yeah, is like if you can get to a point where you read enough or you have enough information and you have enough experiences collected that you try to make a rational decision and people do get to that too right yeah um but yeah i guess like the, the thing would be like training ourselves to do that more often right? to do that earlier to, to engage that rational part of our brain to to examine our lives that's the hard part yeah i guess i, guess I don't know how how hmm. how do people do that yeah, I mean, I, I guess I wasn't trying to uh, have you offer a step-by-step solution. I was just trying to talk more, because I think it's a common topic that, that we can talk about in a lot of our podcasts, is, uh, and I think we've touched on it before. We definitely have, yeah. It's like the keystone to like self-improvement, right, basically, mm-hmm. is motivation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Like, actually, I was talking to, um, I don't know if I should name names in this in this podcast. I was talking to one of our friends about uh, his dating situation. <clears throat> and yeah, like, he basically told me the exact same thing. He's like, oh, yeah, like, I want a girlfriend. I'm like, oh, so why don't you? He's like, oh, but then, you know, I, like, the, the effort of doing it isn't worth it, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Like, he'll, he'll get sad. Right, he all gets sad, his motivation goes up, but he never reaches that critical mass. Mm-hmm. And then he'll do something to make himself feel better. And that's something right, I'm just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say play video games, but okay, yeah, let's let's go with that. <laughs> I mean, you got it's got to target this specific need, right? <laughs> sure, and, sure. And then it goes down, and like he just never reaches that that that, that critical mass. Mm-hmm. mass. Yeah, that's a really good example too. Um, there's a whole. The, the whole neat thing in Japan, right? Mm. Um, no, I think that's caused by something else. There, there's there's definitely a lot of societal pressure in Japan, and I know their whole like work culture is extremely, extremely toxic and, and messed up. But I think to, to get into that state and to stay in that state, it, like clearly this, this is not a state you want to be in for the rest of your life, but it's like a form of escapism for them because the pressures of society caught up to them and they kind of retreated into this shell of this comfortable shell right where they surround themselves with like video games or anime or whatever just things that they don't have to think they don't have to get stressed about things that you know the the empty calorie um entertainment that we talk about so much and i think once you get into yourself into that kind of shell it, it's it becomes so hard to come out because outside of that is is the pressures of real life what pushed you into the shell in the first place. And the longer you stay in that shell, the more comfortable you are in that kind of environment. And I think it's very dangerous. To a degree, this is kind of what I did in Waterloo when I stopped actively going to classes and stuff and kind of just stayed in my room as long as possible. And yeah, it's it's, it's hard. It's honestly, it's, it's pretty hard to get out of it. Yeah, I, 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 mm, 
I think we often wanted to make people comfortable, and we want to give people a held on things, right? <clears throat> when it's too tough. And I think I've come to the conclusion that where we are right now is we're giving people too many outs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we're not we're not giving them the chance to rise up to the occasion, I guess. Right? It's like, oh, you feel bad? Oh, like do this thing to make you happy. Like, what make you feel happy? Uh, and there's just like too many ways for escapism. Yeah, that's true. That's too true. many ways to escape things. Um, like there's so much entertainment out there right now, right? Like these guys can literally live their entire lives in their one room. That's crazy, right? Back in the day, like I think you'd be forced out, right? Yeah, you'd be just and so bored. That would have eventually gotten you moving and eventually you would have gotten better, I think. Um, it reminds me of sort of like how we treat anxiety disorders, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you have a, if you have anxiety towards something, right? The, the worst thing we can do is help you escape that anxiety. So what I'm talking about is like when we talk about treating anxiety disorder, let's say you're really anxious about going to the dentist, right? And let's say what you usually do is you go to the dentist and in the waiting room, you're super anxious. And what you do is you take out your iPad and you just watch something, right? Mm -hmm. And until you can get in there and then like you distract yourself by talking to someone else or whatever, right? That's That doesn't help you get better, right? What helps you get better is to remove that iPad, to face the anxiety, right? That That's how you actually get better. Um, I think we call them, what do we call them? Gay behaviors or something? Um, yeah, like basically if, if you're doing something to remove that anxiety rather than letting it build up and learning how to deal with it, then you're not solving the problem. Mm. Interesting. And it's funny that you say how like it's like society, I think at one point you said that society is making us this way, but we are the ones who created it. Is this really, is this really interesting sad interesting but also hopeful i think way to look at it which is um let's say we really desire like high calorie foods right like back in the day when sugar was scarce right coming to a across a sugary food really helped you survive because it gave you calories and we desire that so much that we create an endless supply of it that's the sad part but i think the mm -hmm. hopeful part is that we have this frontal cortex, right? We have this piece of the, our brain that's making decisions independent of our emotions, right? That's learning from our behaviors and and it puts a cap on your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, brain, that part of the brain can then tell us that, hey, it's bad to do this, right? And then for us to either change our behavior or I think the more effective way is change the environment, right? To make things better. Hmm. Yeah, I think. Can you give a concrete example of changing the environment? Like. Sure. Like so, getting a new uh, job for... or getting out of this toxic relationship or. Oh, no, something super simple. Let's say um, you are uh, like you eat a lot of junk food, let's just say, right? Um, what you could do is, I guess, one simple thing. Let's say you have soft drinks in your fridge. Right. What you can do is you can put uh, the healthier foods in f on, at the front of the fridge so that you're mm. seeing the junk food last, right? And now you're more inclined to, when you need to grab something, you grab the healthy food, right? Like it always takes an effort at first to create that environment. But once you've created that environment, it's like a positive feedback loop. So the next step you can take, right, would be um, just not buy any junk food, right? Mm. Like, like when you go grocery shopping, don't buy any junk food. So all on, only food that's available in your house are healthy food right and eventually you adapt to that like that's kind of what i mean by changing the environment and mm -hmm. i think that's like the the better way of changing habits right compared to willpower like willpower i think is a bit oversold like it's mm -hmm. like what you want is to use the willpower for short short extent so that you can change your environment which then decreases the amount of willpower you need to use right mm -hmm. if you need to use willpower constantly you're you're probably fucked <laughs> I think that makes sense, yeah. I don't know if you read that book, The Power of Habit. I think it's called The Power of Habit. Um, I think I have it on Audible from a long time ago. I think I read like a little bit of it and I, was, I got bored. Yeah, it kind of uh, uses a lot of different real life examples to reinforce the idea that we can basically use habits to program ourselves to you know, lead better lives, right? And it was using some very extreme examples to show what we're capable of. 
Um, but uh, one key takeaway I got from it was, uh, I think they said you only need to do something 27 times before it becomes a natural habit of yours. So I'm wondering in this case, is it possible to just through willpower alone sustain those 27 times, you know, until I think I think it's hard, but um, it, it, it might be possible to brute force yourself to to change certain things. I mean, I think it's definitely possible. Um, yeah, like I've made so many habit changes mm-hmm. in the past couple of years. Um, so I told you about how I went to med school because I had chronic pain, right? Right. And right. I tried to figure out how to fix it through this exercise regimen. Anyway, that exercise regimen at the beginning took about three hours each day. <laughs> so you can imagine sustaining that habit was quite difficult. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And eventually I whittled that down and down, like, you know, but I still have this habit that I carry over. Like, and that basically started from willpower. Another thing would be like, I got really bad dry eyes in this last couple of years too. And like, I use eye drops like seven times a day, I think. And that has to be built into habit too, right? Mm. And like, there's this whole routine that I have to do. And that gets built into habit, right? Like, I've done it. And I think 27 times sounds reasonable. And I think it's definitely doable. Yeah, sounds about right. Um, I think we pretty much covered everything we can about the topic of lifespan. Is there anything else that was left unsaid you want to bring up before we say sayonara? <laughs> Not really, but I think, yeah, we should probably read more into it. Like I, uh, I do the things that are free and that easy to do, right? Like the intermittent fasting, the exercise and whatever, right? But mm-hmm. yeah, like the next step for me is really read into about the the molecules they talk about, so like metformin, resveratrol, uh, nicotinamide, uh, yeah, like those things. Like I think it's probably worth a read and like figuring out where to get those supplements and stuff and like mm-hmm. whether or not they work. Yeah, that's something that I I think I've given myself a deadline of like maybe within one year to try to figure out. Uh, luckily, we're pretty young, so I think we have time. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds good. I mean. I'm glad you said we're pretty young because I don't hear that a lot. So, dude, uh, actually, tomorrow's my birthday. Oh my god! Wait, it is a whole oh shit. Wait, dude, I'm I'm turning twenty nine. Okay, like, how do you uh... feel? <laughs> how do you feel, man? Sucks to be old. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till next year. <laughs> oh Damn. yeah, dude, it's it's wild, man. We're almost thirty. Almost the big three zero. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. We'll end the podcast here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And by everybody, I mean Jeff. And we'll see you guys next time. I'm my fiance. Shout out to Vanessa. <laughs>